Stephen Warner on the Barton organ with a little Mark Mothersbaugh tunes there, if anyone uh, noticed. Uh, welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton. I'm the series director. Today we are privileged to present Devo founder, polymath, prolific creator, a.k.a. bougie boy, agent of chaos, a.k.a. Chucky Finister, Mark Mothersbaugh. <laughs> it is quite thrilling, I must say. And I want to thank our partners as today's program is a co-presentation with Grand Rapids Art Prize, which is happening now in Grand Rapids through October the 9th. You should go if you haven't been yet. There's time. And we have additional support from the University of Michigan Museum of Art, the Ann Arbor Art Center's Pop-X, the Ann Arbor Film Festival, and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. It feels especially apt and good to host this Midwestern native son uh, here in Ann Arbor, a little far from Akron, but still, Mother's Ba's journey is entwined with our dear partner, the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Uh, you will hear more about this, but his little band Devo did have an award-winning number one first prize award-winning film at the 14th Ann Arbor Film Festival, which helped launch more of Devo's career. More to come on this, but I know that the Ann Arbor Film Festival is particularly thrilled by this history, and they are here today. They are out in the lobby. Uh, they have lots of information for you because coming up this March is the 55th Ann Arbor Film Festival celebration, and you never know what might happen if you enter the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Proof today, right here on the stage. Uh, to better serve the airwaves, Today's presentation, we have a new partner, folks, WCBN 88.3. That's to the far left of your dial, Ann Arbor. Uh, they are doing a live broadcast. Hello out there in Radioland, and welcome. Uh, so everyone, please text, tweet your friends, let them know uh, they can turn on the radio to 88.3 WCBN and catch the show. And. Uh, Actually, earlier today, a couple of WCBN DJs were here and did an extensive interview, which is going to be aired later. So keep your uh, ears tuned to that radio station. Uh, for those of you who are here to see Mark and have no idea what the Penny Stamp Series is, just a quick word of explanation. The Penny Stamp Series is a program at the University of Michigan Stamp School of Art and Design. Uh, this is a program which looks to bring creators and innovators, such as our guests today, for our students to engage with creative leaders. It takes place here every Thursday at the Michigan Theater. It is always free and open to the public, so get our schedule. Find us online at pennystampsevents.org or Facebook and plan to join us here more often. The format of today's event, as you can see, we have furniture on the stage. There is going to be a conversation eventually, but we are actually going to start with a presentation. And following the presentation and the conversation, we are going to have a Q&A today. We are not going to have the typical in the screening room Q&A. The Q&A is going to be right here in this theater today. There are microphones on stands you will find at the ends of the aisles downstage. Anyone sitting in the balcony, if you have a question, you're going to have to come down and get in line. So when the time comes, line up at the microphones and you'll get to ask your question. Uh, so to give a proper introduction to Mark's work and to lead the conversation today, we have found just the right man to unpack the complexities before us. Adam Lerner not only curated the major retrospective, Mark Mothersbaugh Myopia, which is currently touring the country, but he authored the book by the same name, which incidentally, you can get a copy of. It is in the lobby. Nicholas Books is there with copies of Myopia and other things. Both uh, Mark and Adam have signed copies of those books today, so they are out there for you. In his day job, Adam Lerner is the director and chief animator of the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver. He has curated dozens of exhibitions and projects with contemporary artists such as Barnaby Furness, Liam Gillick, and Christian Marclay. He's also showcased the non-traditional talents of astrobiologists, shamans, and pigeoneers. 
Uh, in a 2011 article in the New York Times, it stated that Lerner's work to engage audiences is reshaping the model for the contemporary art museum, thus the title, Chief Animator. Uh, Adam is going to begin by giving you the background story, the story behind the man, before he asks Mark to join him. So please join me in welcoming Adam Lerner. Hello, wow, thank you, Christina, that was amazing. And what a wonderful um, opportunity this is. It's really exciting to be here and talk about Mark Mothersbaugh. Um, and I hope that if uh, you enjoyed the talk, then you could sort of, after seeing the movie, read the book. Um, here we have um, books, uh, Mark Mothersbaugh Myopia, that we worked on that coincided with the exhibition that I curated. Um, so, Many people here probably know Mark from this. <laughs> from Devo, right? The band with the funny red hats. You know, Whip It, their version of Satisfaction. Of course, like, you know, anyone who is about my age definitely knows them. They were, you know, number one hit band. And Mark was the front man of that band and the co-founder. Maybe sort of more advanced students of Mark Mothersbaugh, they might know something like, oh, that he also did the scores for many Wes Anderson films, like Life Aquatic and, other, and others. Um, maybe even more advanced, maybe sort of the graduate students of Mark Mothersbaugh, you know, might know that he scored Pee Wee's Playhouse and the Pee Wee series, Rugrats, exactly all of this. And maybe even the sort of like professors of Mark Mothersbaugh might even know that he did visual art. But what I'm here to do before is to sort of set the stage so that everybody has, is on the same level as to what Mark's career was about, and then I'll come out and have, uh, and then I'll invite Mark out, and then we'll talk, and then he will give color to it all, I'm sure. So, um, you know Mark as a composer musician, but he started off as an artist. He enrolled at Kent State University in 1968, and there you see him from when he was a student, looking like a hippie, as you should in 1968. And um, he was at the time very inspired by artists like Andy Warhol, and he would make things like these decals that he would put up around campus. Um, and you know, this was actually before there was such a thing as street art, and um, it was, there really wasn't graffiti, and so this was actually a pretty radical way of doing things. Um, and he caught the attention of other sort of students who are artists on campus, and um, well, then things started to take off from there. So if some of you know your history and can do your math, and you know that if Mark was at Kent State University, 19, enrolled in 1968, then he was there May 4th, 1970, when the National Guard opened fire on student protesters to the Vietnam War, killing four of them. And this was a traumatic moment, not just for the students on the campus and for people like Mark, who were protesters and there, um, people who saw their friends die next to them, but it was a traumatic moment for the entire country. And Mark and his group of artist friends did what people did in the 60s when they sort of had an idea or had a thought that they liked. They formed a collective. And they formed this collective um, around the idea that the world, as they saw it, was not evolving, it was devolving. And that's why they formed the band Devo. Oh, I love it, I love it, God bless you. People are, are just finding that out because, um, because you know, that's the thing. We all know um, of Devo as the band of the funny red hats. But many people don't know the deep philosophical, historical origins that, um, was, that, that, that went throughout um, the band. And in fact, um, they really didn't see themselves as a band. They saw themselves more as this art collective around the idea of de-evolution that made films, music, visual art, had performances, dressed in costumes, and the whole package was Devo. So here's Mark and his fellow um, co-founder of the band, Jerry Casale, in Jerry Casale's apartment soon after the shootings and the school was closed down. 
and they're both playing music, um, and they're both wearing masks. Mask play was a kind of thing that they did. Um, and interestingly, Mark found one mask that he called Boogie Boy. And when he wore this mask, it was this sort of man-child grotesquerie that he so identified with, it became a kind of lifelong alter ego. And after wearing this mask, he didn't go back to any other mask, and that became like the mask for him. But the idea of the mask was very important. Um, maybe not just because of you know, this, but there's something about the influence of this idea of the grotesque, the monstrous, on his whole aesthetic sensibility. So if you see the kind of art that he started to make after May 4th, 1970, you can see some of these influences, like um, these postcard-sized collages and prints that he would make, that you, where you can see this sort of Dada-esque, um, surreal combination of you know, um, this sort of figure with a gas mask in this cosmic environment. Um, you see in, like the sort of oxygen mask in this character in this sort of moonscape or this other medical image. So these were important parts of what defined his sensibility at the time. But what's crucial is that he was sort of seeing himself in the early 1970s as as much a visual artist as anything else. And as I try to understand who this character, Mark Mothersby, was when I was curating the exhibition, um, I, I, I had to go through about four storage spaces filled with materials. I mean, I should just tell you a little, you know, side, a side fact is that as a curator, um, you are really happy when you work on an artist like Mark Mothersbaugh, and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. Nobody's ever worked on him before in any serious way. Like, this is great, I could be the hero. And then, um, like after two years of going through like hundreds of boxes of materials that haven't been opened in 40 years, I'm like, I really wish another curator had done some work <laughs> on Mark Mothersbaugh. Anyway, um, so when I was trying to figure out really what, what was the thread that runs through all of his works, I saw this aspect of grotesquerie, this aspect of the monstrous, the mutation, the mutant that he was interested in, and this character that was very much defined by these masks. But I saw this whole other side that I couldn't quite make sense of. And so I'd look through his journals, um, and I would see pages like this, where he's obsessed with grids or these highly structured mathematical um, sort of layouts and matrices. You know, here, this sort of fake accounting-like um, system that he has in these various colors, or this here. And by the way, when you see pages in a journal like this, that's when you understand this. Right? So, so Devo, as a band, was the expression of this artistic idea, this obsession with mimicking the ordered, methodical nature of our capitalist, you know, um, consumerist society. They, these characters looked like they were produced on an, uh, on an assembly line. But Devo was not just this sort of aspect of order. Devo was also Boogie Boy. And so many of you who know Devo as the band with the funny red hats would not know necessarily that Boogie Boy, Mark's alter ego, was in fact an icon of Devo just as much as the sort of ordered um, uniformity was an icon or symbol of the band and in fact was often part of their press and the, especially in the early days. So here you see um, Mark as Boogie Boy in the video, um, it was actually the film, that, um, be, that won at the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Um, in the beginning was the end, the truth about de-evolution. And um, that film, which was then circulated throughout the country as the Ann Arbor Film Festival winners were packaged and then sent on the road. And that became then the like, launch pad for the band's success. And ultimately led to them signing in 1978, their record deal. But I want everyone to understand that um, Devo was both. Devo was both the sort of uniformity that you would see in an image like this in these figures on the right with their um, highly robotic movements and their sort of 
um, overly um, uh, mechanical sort of stance and choreography. And then it was also this character who was free from that, this character who was a little bit of a monstrous character, but also a little bit of a mutant and, and, and a little bit free. And so the philosophy of, of de-evolution um, was very, very central to what they're thinking about because evolution as a principle is, of course, has its structure, has its order. Things continue according to their own internal logic in the same pathways until you get to a mutation. A mutation then creates the possibility for there to be change. So it's the mutants, it's the monster, it's the freak who actually creates change in the world. The freak who creates the possibility of newness. And I think that, yes, that's it, give it up. <laughs> and that is the underlying tension. So I realize that there's not one thing that underlies all of Marx's art, it's two things. It's this utter tension always between mimicking the sort of orderly uniformity of our society and breaking free of it. So, so you see that in all of his art, and so after, from the 1970s on, he made art um, at a, very often at a very, very small scale. Um, these are postcard size works, using the, these sort of absurdist and uh, grotesque characters very often um, as these central elements. Now he makes between one and 50 of these a day, and he has um, amassed um, right now over 30,000 of them. And they became the basis of all of his art. So he, from these, he then makes prints, he makes sculpture, he makes draw, um, rugs and videos and even musical instruments. And, um, and that's the basis of the exhibition and the book that I curated um, and worked on with Mark, Myopia, is sort of this body of artistic material. It traveled to six museums, and then its last venue is gonna come up in the spring in New York at the Gray Art Gallery at NYU, and hope you have the chance to see it then. Um, but here's, it would be an example of like one of the prints that he would make based upon sort of an earlier um, postcard-like drawing. But he would also do all sorts of other works that carried the same tension between the mutation and the orderly. Like these series of photographs that he began in the 1990s that, are, that he called beautiful mutants that have this sense of order, this sort of repetition of the same, but also this sort of creation of a mutant. And these, they're, they're, they're funny, but they're also a little disturbing. And then he, he takes them in all different directions, even into sculpture. Like you see this two scion car, or these two rumped My Little Ponies. And he even creates mutant instruments, like these, what he calls orchestrions, these music-making machines that he makes out of um, recycled organ parts. It's here for the organ. <laughs> All right. Um, and the sounds are atypical for any instrument, so it's basically using that philosophy of it's your mutation that makes, that creates newness. So it's because you have these found objects that he composes for, he can't work within a normal scale that he would within, a, say, a piano. And so therefore he's forced to make, create new kinds of sounds. And that's in the way in which the sort of your, your disabilities also are the source of your specialness. And so this is, for example, like what it would sound like. <laughs> I think I just took that recording from my phone, by the way, that's why it sounds so awful, it was just in the gallery. But um, anyway, what he uses, he uses both the organ pipes and also um, he created one music making machine out of these bird calls, that, about 100 bird calls that he's been collecting over the years. And all of this idea of the sort of mutants and, and um, like uh, this sort of his interest in how it is your disabilities create your sense of creativity, actually, I feel like it all came together for me when I found this one 
work of art that he made in 1975, looking through 30,000 of them, and but there's a one that just, it all came home. I'm not sure if you're gonna feel this, but I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll see. And it was this one here. It was just these legs, these kind of 19th century sort of medical illustration-like legs with these braces. So it's clearly somebody who's at a, who's disabled, who's at a disadvantage in some ways in the world. And it's the thing that corrects your disadvantage that in some ways is the source of your specialness. We know that because you probably can't see it, but on top of those legs, it says, says self-portrait, 1975. So, there's this other side of this, though, which is that Mark um, doesn't just find the sort of sense of creativity in the sort of mutation, but also he finds the creativity in that thing that we saw back with made him, made him be attracted to the, the boogie boy mask. And that was his, his obsession with childhood, that it's the child that's able to also escape from the strictures of our modern society. And so you have this sort of sense of childlike play and freedom in Boogie Boy, but also in so much of his art throughout his life, like these roly-polies that have a sweetness to them uh, that's really undeniable. Um, or, and he makes, of course, these prints, um, and original prints and paintings out of those figures. And then um, you see his sense of, I don't know, audacity um, combined with his sense of play um, and his interest in spectacle even in a work like this, which is the world's largest ruby that Mark carved into something like a soft serve ice cream cone. And also, um, maybe it looks a little bit like a pile of poop. And also, a little bit like a Devo hat, an energy dome. And that's exactly the kind of surreal, pop, slightly comical sensibility that he brings to all of his works. And this was work from 2014. And all of the postcards were on display. These are the example of the 30,000 of them. Um, so now I'm going to have um, Mark come in and tell his story directly. So thank you, Mark. Um, Mark, do you want to come out here? Thanks. There's no avoiding it. A clean stage is a mean stage. Great. Well, um, the audience is a very unenthusiastic audience, so you're going to have to think of some really great things to get them excited. Well, I can't see them. They're there. I are you, are okay. you there? Okay, cool. I think they're there. I had this thought a couple minutes ago while I was listening to you. I was thinking, what a great, this could be a good conceptual piece where, like after you finish, about six or more people each take, take a, a turn at it until we finally finish the whole thing with, okay. and, and I so, never have to. Would you like to do that tonight? Like, um, you know, the chief of police could come out and talk about my driving record, how it's <laughs> okay, could be worse, it's not so bad. Super. Well, um, I'm sorry that I'm here instead of the chief of police, but um, why don't we uh, um, give color to the story that I told, if you can, by starting off in the early days. So when, describe for us the scene for you around the time that Diva was founded? What were your interests? What was going on for you? Okay, um, he's referring to the, you know, like the 70s, you know, the very beginning of the 70s. Um, I, I started at Kent State in 1968 and um, uh, I wasn't exactly sure what I was doing there, but I, I knew I, I loved art and wanted to study art, and I had hated school for 
kindergarten through 12th grade because somehow I was the guy with a kick me sign on his back because <laughs> I had thick glasses and I was the shortest, skinniest guy in the school with a big light bulb shaped head. And uh, it just it went on year after year. So I just thought school was the worst idea ever. And then uh, I accidentally ended up at Kent and it was a totally different thing for me. It was like I went from and it was a great time to be at Kent. It was, a, it was like a very exciting atmosphere there. But, but it w I went from, uh, you know, like having nightmares about going to school the next day to like uh, watching, finding out the kids at like 3 or 3.30, they'd be looking at their watches and the bell would ring and they'd dart out the door and head off to their, you know, activities for the evening. Uh, and that meant I had the whole art department to myself. And, and in the first year I was there, I found out about printmaking. It became a passion for me. And, uh, and I really liked school. And I was there, and I remember in 1970, at, in the early spring, uh, there was, SDS did some thing where they said, hey, come watch us napalm a dog on campus. And I was like, I'd like to, what is that? How can you do that? Because we, you know, on TV, you'd, we watched the Vietnam War every day, and so I saw that we were dropping napalm on Vietnam, and uh, so I went to this demonstration of what napalm looked like, and um, there was this poor little dog shivering on a table, and these, guy, these guys were talking ab about, they said, let us explain to you how it works, and they told you that when napalm touches the skin, it's its amazing property is it just keeps burning. It goes right through you. It just can like burn a path, you know, in your body. And they said, we're going to show you what it looks like by putting some on this dog. And they go, is anybody here going to stop us? And of course, everybody said, yeah. And then uh, they said, well, the bo our box and napalm, we don't really have napalm. It's against the law. But they were talking about how many people we that had, had napalm just dropped on them that were just uh, villagers. And I went home and thought, I can't think of a single Vietnamese person I wanted to kill. And I thought I would be bad at that. I wouldn't be the right person because I couldn't put my heart into it. And uh, so I was happy to be at school. And when, they, when kids there organized to protest the war in Vietnam, I joined in. And uh, they shot students and killed them, uh, some of them, and a bunch of them were just wounded, and uh, they closed our school down. So there's this guy I'd met about six months earlier, uh, Jerry Casale. Uh, he had come up to me one day. He was a grad student. I was a sophomore, I think, at the time. And he'd said, um, are you the guy putting up pictures of astronauts holding potatoes all around campus? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, what's a potato mean to you? And we started talking, and he had this whole idea that, like, you know, I, I feel like I'm a potato in, in the vegetable kingdom, you know, where I'm not a glamorous, you know, like, uh, you know, Richard Gere or whoever he used as an example at the time because it was 1978, so it was probably pre-Richard Gere. But um, he says, you know, we're not asparagus people or eggplants people, you know, we're like proletariats, you know, we're from Akron, we're from Kent, Ohio. He was from Kent, I was from Akron. And he says, we're from Ohio and, you know, we're, potatoes are like, dirty and asymmetric, but they have eyes all around and they can see everything. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, all right, I like this guy. So, so, um, so we started uh, doing artwork together. We were making posters for different events that were going on at Kent. And I was helping him with his grad student project. I was, uh, I printed little decals of little green potato men for him so that he could put them on these blow-ups of, uh, of uh, kids that were in his high school graduation class. <clears throat> and, <laughs> and he was kind of like this kind of smarty guy. Anyhow, so, we, so they shut the school down after the shootings, and he would come over to my, my house, and we would make music, because we couldn't go to Kent for, till it was May, like May 4th, and then they shut the school down until September middle of September when the, the new fall season was there. So, so he would come over and we'd talk about what was going on in the world and we would make music and we'd talk about art and we, had, we decided that what we were observing wasn't evolution but rather de-evolution. 
And um, we decided what we, one of the things we had in common was that we both loved all the art movements in Europe between World War I and World War II. So we, we were fascinated with the Dadaists and uh, the Bauhaus movement and futurists and suprematists and in Russia that believed, that, that preached uh, man over nature. And, uh, and uh, we, we found all that stuff very fascinating and we thought, well, okay, let's, let's be an agitprop group. We, that's what we kind of wanted to be. And we, we were also influenced by the early artists of that, uh, I mean, the artists that were current at that time, you know, the Rauschenbergs and, and but especially like Andy Warhol, because he was like um, a painter and he was a printmaker and he was a photographer and he uh, made movies and he produced the Velvet Underground and through great parties, and we thought, yeah, I, I, we like the idea of, of not being about a specific technique, your art, that your art could be an idea, and you could use whatever medium was out there that best expressed your, your idea. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> it was like some sort of an it's exotic a, bird. It's here or, for conceptual uh, art. And then, then, I, and then it clapped at the end. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're, they're loving it. It's going. <laughs> we could have a couple more people come out and, and like do different testimonials. Yeah. Um, is there the chief? Is the chief of police here? So, um, so. When we were starting Devo, things were happening that had never happened before. Everybody had always had vinyl discs. But I remember Chuck Statler, who went to school with us uh, at Kent, came over one day and he had a copy of Popular Science Magazine. And on the cover was this young, young Americans like smiling and wahoo. And one of them was either the guy or the woman was holding up this silver reflective, what looked like a 12 inch LP. And it said, and on Popular Science Magazine, it said, laser discs. Everyone will have them by Christmas time. And so we, we read about it, and they're like, not only do you get an album of music, but you get visual art. And we thought, this was invented for us. Laser discs were invented for, we're the perfect band. Sound and vision, that's, that's what we do. It's like, artists are going to take over pop culture. Rock and roll is going to die. We, it was 1974 or something like that, and we were like ready to celebrate the death of rock and roll and, and pop music the way it was, because now it meant artists were going to... Um, <laughs> anyhow, so we made our first film. We made our first film, and we finished it in 1976. I remember Jerry and I started a graphic design shop in downtown Akron, and uh, one of you know one of the many things that we did to make money is is uh, there was a Rust-Oleum company that wanted T-shirts printed, so we came up with this logo, Rust Never Sleeps, and I found these like uh, these kind of rusty letters, and I. I, I took that logo and I, we bought just, a, they ordered, they wanted like a hundred shirts or something and it was, we were, you know, we were going to make like a dollar a shirt or something as profit, which would go a long way towards the $3,000 that we needed to make our first seven and a half minute film. But uh, I, I was, I had only bought exactly enough shirts because I didn't want to, you know, cut into our profit too far. So I started printing on things around my house because I was printing in my basement. And I printed on a pair of uh, my underpants on the seat of them. It said, Russ never sleeps. And thought that was, that was like better than they should. I, I was thinking, oh, they should give out underpants instead of t-shirts. That'd be funnier. Because, you know, it's like the underside of a car and everything. There was a, anyhow, they didn't, I never showed it to them because it probably wouldn't have helped the make the sale in the end. But we, we, we made $3,000. It took us about six months. And then we shot this film uh, in Akron. Uh, Jerry and I came up with the concept, and Chuck directed it. And he put it together, a team of 
people to help us make this film. It was like the Little Rascals. We, you know, we hadn't really done this before, and we just kind of, and we had two songs, Jocko Homo and uh, kind of a, a really twisted version of Secret Agent Man, a Johnny Rivers song, and, and some interstitial footage. Um, well, we finished it in 1976, and uh, there was no such thing as MTV yet. That was a long ways away. And, um, but we were like, what do we do with it? So, you know, we would play at some club where our 12 or 13 friends that knew us would come down to the club on a Friday night and we'd put a sheet up on the wall and we'd borrow a 16 millimeter projector from uh, the library, take it out for the weekend and then uh, show the movie and then we'd go on stage and play. And uh, Chuck, said, why don't we, yeah, this is 1975, so Chuck said, why don't we enter it in the Ann Arbor Film Festival? <laughs> Which we did. So, you know, we're, we're like in a basement in Akron, and uh, Chuck's like more together about this stuff than us, and he puts together this film and sends it out. And wouldn't you know it, we got first prize film short. Yeah. <laughs> The truth about de-evolution. So anyhow, so that was kind of in some ways, that was kind of the start of recognition for Devo because that film then got added into a circuit of short films that had won in film festivals around the country and it toured. And um, art students went to these kind of things, film shows for film shorts. And so the people that were seeing our movie were, were around the country were, were um, a lot like you guys probably, but a long time ago. And uh, when it got out to the West Coast, uh, there was this magazine called Search and Destroy and another mag in San Francisco and another one in LA called Slash. And they were both the, um, the current art scene, music scene, of those city, of those respective cities, and both of them printed up uh, like stills from the the movie and put them in their magazine. And at the same time, there was um, people in the record business, record industry, uh, saw these films and they went. Somebody at the main M Records said, "Hmm, I just signed the Tubes. These guys look like another version of the Tubes." I better check them out. So he sent us, uh, Kip Cohen sent us a check for $2,000 to pay for gas for us to drive an Econoline van full of equipment and six guys. We took our sound man, Ed, with us. And we drove out to LA and we did a, uh, what do you call it? A showcase. We did a showcase. All the punk fans in LA showed up. And uh, then the headliner that had just got signed to, I don't know what label, maybe A&M, the Clowns, really, there was a band called The Clowns that were heavy metal and they had like um, striped bell-bottom pants. In retrospect, I think I probably would like, appreciate them more now than I did then. We just made fun of them back then. But, but nobody showed up to see them and he was kind of like, that's interesting that all these kids showed up to see Devo, but then the next day he told us, well, I couldn't hum any of your melodies uh, when I got home and uh, I think you guys should just go back to Ohio. And uh, so we were like, we're not listening to you, Mr. Record Company Executive. And, and, we, and you know, it's, I don't know, I kind of am not telling this story in a linear fashion, but you know, it's... It's, it's okay. Go on. Okay, just keep talking or should keep I... Talking. They're liking you want to talk for a yeah. while? No, you're just oh, you did a really good one. You, you were actually, was, yours was very articulate, so, <laughs> and uh, it made job. sense. Anyhow, so it's like, um, you know, it's like, why I told you the story about Kent State is because we were these idealistic kids, and kind of like, just warning you, mom and dad, kind of like the kids are today right now. We were very, we felt like we could change things in our country. And, you know, after everybody got shot, not at just at our campus, but there were, there, were, uh, there were problems in other campuses in the country, it kind of became obvious right away that if 
they don't like what you're saying. It was easy to put, put you down in, in a rebellion was not a, was obsolete and was not a way to change things. And um, I remember, you know, I was, we were thinking like, who does change things in this country? How do, how do things change in America at this point? And uh, I was listening to the radio and it was Pachelbel's Canon, which some of you know what it is. It's like this very beautiful piece of classical music. And set to music was, Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. And I remember thinking, well, it's Madison Avenue. That's who changes things. And, that's, and they don't do it through rebellion. They do it through subversion. They, they lure you in. They, they enter your, your bloodstream and, and affect your DNA from inside. And so... That's kind of what gave Devo the interest, the idea of subversion. That's how, that's how we're going to change things. That's, that's kind of what gave us the idea that we want to go out to Hollywood and uh, see if we were strong enough to um, exist in that toxic scenario. And uh, we did get signed. We got a record deal. And we were kind of like a, a trophy band for... Warner Brothers, who were making so much money, they could sign trophy bands. They had like Frank Zappa for a trophy band, and they had Wild Man Fisher, and they had Captain Beefheart for a trophy band, and uh, then they had Devo, and we were like a, you know, we were just this. Yeah, they're weird. It's like, you know, we told them we'd get, we'd make life size cutouts of them and put them in all the record stores, and they said, how much would that cost? And we said five thousand dollars, and they said, can we have the money? and make a film, and we're like, what would we do with another film, uh, you know? They wanted to make a film for the song Satisfaction. What are we supposed to do with that, you know? And, uh, and uh, you know, we never... Anyhow. <laughs> so, it kind of went good, because we had a couple albums, where, three albums, they didn't pay any of attention until all of a sudden, the song Whip It got on the radio and it got started playing in clubs and, and it, you know, went international. And it was maybe the dumbest song we ever wrote. Um, <laughs> but it was, but you know, we were doing a, we were doing what we thought was like a Devo version of a funk album. <laughs> it's true, we did. I mean, we thought it was an R&B record. We wanted to make an R&B. So that was, that was kind of, for us, that was pretty, that was about as R&B as we could get. And, uh, and we, we, uh, that changed the, the scrutiny. All of a sudden, we made this record company millions of dollars because they didn't give us hardly anything, and we didn't care. We, we had decided that we were going to take salaries out of the money we made from the record company that was equivalent to what you pay a school teacher. And so we were kind of cool with that idea. And that's how, and so that meant we had money to invest in, you know, like experimenting with electronics, experimenting with film, experimenting with, with um, visual images and uh, costumes and staging and choreography. Uh, so we could put our money into to our art. And um, should I then, stop? Then, then can you just describe on along that path what Boogie Boy's role was in your terms in Devo? Yeah. Or not, you don't have to, it's okay. I was Boogie Boy. I am Boogie Boy still, uh, but Boogie Boy, back in uh, Akron, we entertained ourselves. None of us really could be enthusiastic about bowling, which was kind of the prime source of, uh, <laughs> of entertainment in those days in Akron, and um, we never really were bowlers. And so, so what we did, what we did do is we'd go to novelty shops, Bob and Jerry and I, and we'd buy masks, and then we'd become characters. Uh, he liked to be the all-knowing Chinaman who knew everything, and and uh, Bob Mother's Ba was a clown who was kind of a, a mischievous clown sometimes, or he he was just a janitor, and then. And then I, I, I kind of like gravitated towards Boogie Boy, and I did it for a specific reason. 
Um, before Devo, I was a, I was just kind of a, like a, a dumb kid floating around in Akron, and I was a church organ player at my parents' church. And I kind of lost, I felt like I wasn't getting answers when I asked people things and, you know, about stuff. And, and it was one of those, it was a, a, a good church where it just, it stressed the work, work ethic. That was it. That was your, the best way to get close to God was through work. So that part stuck with me my whole life. But um, there were some people that had dropped out of our church and they, they had said, hey, you want to come to a dinner at our church? And I was like, a free dinner? And my girlfriend and I, we thought, okay, well, we're, we have a date where somebody else is paying for the dinner. Or how bad can that be? So we went to this um, Steelworkers Union in Cleveland. It was like about 500 people in the room. It was big. And it was like a cafeteria kind of room. And we ate. And then afterwards... Somebody got up and started talking, and, and I remember going, uh oh, okay, here's where we pay for dinner. And this guy got up and he started talking about Christ returning to earth. And I remember just kind of listening, go, I know this story really well, you know. And um, he's saying, and when Jesus returns, he will and it totally freaked me out. I was just sitting there going, what the hell? And the, everybody in the room is fine. They're all like, and they're kind of enthusiastic. And then as soon as he, he does that for about 30 seconds and sits down, and somebody instantly pops up in the audience and they translate. And the translation was something to the effect of, the end times are near, the, you know, we can expect revelations to take, it is already taking place, and blah, blah, blah. And he sits down, somebody else pops up, and they have their own, wee wah wee wah wee wah and, and then they sit down, and somebody else interprets it. And I just remember being so impressed <laughs> and thinking, the idea of surrendering your intellect to the spiritual world was really intriguing to me. I really loved that idea. And I'd already, you know, like, the, you know, through science fiction or some magazines or some, somewhere I'd, I'd heard, well, you know, the human only uses 10% of his brain. And, and we'd already made jokes about that. And, you know, when we were rehearsing with Devo or doing things, we'd go, yep, there's a lot of people not even using that much. And, but, you know, it's like, I, I was wondering, what's the other 90% up to? And so I had this thought that maybe the 10% that we know is like the most boring part and the 10% that, that like helped us get dressed this morning and brush our teeth and, and show up for work or school and then make it over to this room here tonight and then is going to get us back home and, and we'll get our clothes into the dirty clothes hamper or wherever they go or maybe on the counter to wear tomorrow and then... Um, you know, that's the boring part of your brain that has to be the babysitter for the other 90% that's interesting. And maybe that's where, maybe that's where inspiration and ideas and art come from. And so I was really, I, was re I became really interested then in artists that were especially interested in artists that were doing stream of consciousness artwork and, and even just crazy people on the street that were like, you know, shouting. I, I, I'm, I, I remember it, it, where I used to have, like, just walked a little faster. I started slowing down and listening to, like, you know, a ranter with a shopping cart, you know, like, yelling things, and I would just be looking for clues. And uh, so anyhow, so I had this masked boogie boy. And um, I found out when I put on this mask... It freed me from being Mark. It, may, it gave me an opportunity to explore this other place and to explore my own version of what I thought that they might have been hinting at or might have really been dead on at this church. I don't know. No, I, I only went there once. I never went back. I, I felt like I got this incredible information and started off on my own research. And um, 
So Boogie Boy became this character in Devo that was kind of an agent of chaos because we were really, in some ways, because my band, I think it's because my band, nobody was really a great musician. Uh, I kind of had the most training of any of us. And uh, the other four guys, they couldn't play an instrument and sing at the same time. So, so we worked really hard on getting our songs really precise but yet Boogie Boy could be this character who could at least once during the evening kind of go off into this kind of free form uh, place. He could, he could be stream of consciousness. And, and, you know, even to this day, if Devo does a concert somewhere, our encore will be a song that Boogie Boy will come out and sing. And somewhere near the end of the song, there's a place where he'll tell a story, and it, none of us, including me, even know what the story is going to be or what he's going to do or what he's going to say, and sometimes it's just an activity, and sometimes it's like it goes way too long, and, and I'm looking over, and the guys are looking at me like, come on, let's finish this. This isn't very good. Or sometimes you look at them, and they're laughing, and they can't believe it, and they're enjoying it. Or, but it was always some part of... of what was Devo, and I kind, of, I kind of practiced that as much as I could in, in uh, the non-structured part of my life. And um, in many ways, you know, there's a similarity with the way that you make visual art, because making one to 50 of these postcards a day and you're collecting over 30,000 of them is, is kind of not a way of accessing your unconscious minds through yeah it's you know it's it's that's how i work i don't know why i can't really totally explain it i'm trying to do my best and but yeah you're right you you were sitting backstage with me and you looked at postcards and I, one of them you liked i think <laughs> i don't remember I which one it was them. i like a lot of them I just it was one of them it was some, these are from the last couple of days cuz i haven't been home I went um, home yesterday. So, can you talk a little bit about, um, um, in many ways, the origin uh, of your your feeling of being somehow different? You know, this this character that, that became the basis of your visual art, even the reason why we call the book and exhibition myopia. Would you t make sure that you know that you tell that story so that everybody um, understands that part of you? Say that. Say that again. I, oh, yeah. I've been in a band and writing music <laughs> for films for 52 years. So, to, um, is it the glasses story? The what? The glasses story. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so we'll go back a few years before Kent State. Um, I, I had, there were five kids in my family. My dad was a traveling salesman and he sold fire alarms in southern Ohio to farmers. How did that work? And, and um, this one is true too. He sold Niagara cyclo massage pads and they were vibrators basically, but they were giant and ugly like a robot version of a vibrator and, and it was the craziest stuff he sold. And, um, but he would be gone for five days. My mom would be going crazy with five children in Akron and he'd get home and we'd see him for a, little, a few minutes here and there. And uh, somehow through all that, nobody noticed I was um, legally blind, that um, without my glasses, I, I, to this day, I can't see the big E on an eye chart from further than like six to eight inches. And um, I just thought that's the way everybody saw things, you know, because I'd hear a knock on the door, I'd run over there, somebody would come in, I'd get right up in their face, I'd go, hi, Grandma, and then I'd know that, that the red blurry blob that was like walking around in, you know, in, in my field of vision, the, the red blob that looked like a, like a Monet painting out of control was, was, was Granny, and because, you know, you'd hear her voice and you'd know it was her, so then I didn't have to do it to her again that day, but I was always just a little bit tweaky. So anyhow, I'm in second grade, and uh, I hadn't really fit in the first couple years, and, you know, the teacher would say, 
uh, Mr. Mothersbaugh, would you add up the numbers on the board? And I'd go, what's the board? And all the kids would laugh again, and then she'd go, all right, young man, stand up and go to the corner. And I'd, I'd get put in the corner, and I'd go, how do people know the right answer to that? That's the weirdest thing, you know. Other people, they ask the same thing to them, and they know exactly what to say, and they, and they just move on to the next thing, and they ask me, and then it's like this. Anyhow, so near the end of second grade, it was like the last month of second grade, somebody said, you know, maybe they gave me a letter, and I took it home, and it told my parents I, they, I, maybe I should get an eye test. And so they did, and they found out... I, it was correctable, it was myopia. And so I got my first pair of glasses at like, I don't know, what's, I, I think somewhere like May or June of, uh, it was right before the end of school, second grade, and I got these glasses that looked like Coke bottles. But I walked out of this office building and it was the most amazing experience I ever had in my whole life. I looked and I was at a hill that we used to sled ride and we were at the top of the hill in a car, and I could see Newberry Elementary School, the school I had been going to for two years. I'd never seen it before. And I saw the woods I walked through every day because our housing development was on the other side, and I, I knew the streets to walk down, and I knew the woods I could walk through. I never saw what the woods looked like before, and I saw houses. I had never seen a roof on a house or a chimney with smoke coming out of it before. I'd never seen telephone wires. I'd never seen birds flying. Uh, I saw clouds. I saw the sun for the first time in my life. All right in one moment, it was amazing. It was, it totally was this joyful moment in my life. I was so happy. Anyhow, so the next day, I was at school and I was drawing a tree and, um, because I'd never seen a tree before. I'd only seen the trunk of a tree, which, you know, I frequented the one in our front yard, you know, like it, 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 in shocking situations where, you know, one minute you're having running with abandon and the next minute you've met the tree again. <laughs> I'm like, wow. And so I, I'd never seen how beautiful a willow tree was. And, with the, and so I was drawing one. And this teacher that had spanked me, picked me up by the ear, uh, sent me to the office, giving me detention, made me write things, you know, like I'm, I will not be a jerk in class, you know, stuff like that, and a hundred times. And then she said, and I, I didn't even see her say it, I just heard her say it. She said, you draw trees better than me. And, um, is anybody here a school teacher? I wouldn't even know if you were because I can't see anybody's hands. But I can tell you this, be careful what you say to kids because I, I never wanted to be a dad because I thought, oh man, I will say something really fucked up and they will remember it later on and they'll blame everything that went wrong in their life on this thing that I don't even remember. I said, you know. Anyhow, so she said this, but she said this thing to me and and I went home that night, and I dreamt I was going to be an artist. And so that was the day I started wanting to be an artist. I, it was uh, summer of, must have been, how old are you when you're in sixth grade, oh, second grade? Yeah, so it was like 1950 plus uh, however many years that would be. So, so anyhow, so. So it makes sense that um, somebody who felt like he never knew the rules, would become obsessed with rules and as well as be obsessed with the one who's outside, the, um, the outsider to the system. Um, don't worry about it, it wasn't that important. Um, <laughs> just like mouthing off. Um, so let's, let's go back to this, your, the story um, from, the, take it back to the 70s. And, um, no, no, after, after, after Devo, major period of success, you then have um, this transition in your career in the 1980s, the, where you begin to score for movies and television. Can you describe how that happened? Yeah, you know, um we signed with Virgin Records in Europe, and we signed with uh, Warner Brothers for the rest of the world. And um, 
we wrote 12 songs, rehearsed them, went in and recorded them, uh, came up with an album cover, or album art, uh, rehearsed them, designed a stage show and choreography, and made some films to go with the, uh, the songs, and then went on tour. And then a year later, we'd write 12 songs, re rehearse them, record them, make a video, uh, you know, put together a tour and go out and tour, and a year later we'd do it again. And we'd done that six times, and uh, then we, we got in a, I don't even know exactly how or why, but we got in an argument with Warner Brothers and said, we're leaving. And uh, uh, we went, we signed with this other company that we thought was young and, and uh, dynamic and turned out to be a bunch of dummies, and they went bankrupt really quick. And uh, so we were, with about a dozen other bands, we were just trapped in limbo. And uh, a friend of mine, Paul Rubin, called up and said, Mark, will you score my TV show? And so I said, sure, I got time. And, uh, <laughs> and um, he sent me a, a tape on a Monday, and I wrote about 12 songs worth of music for, for a TV show. On Tuesday, I recorded them. <clears throat> Wednesday, we, we packed everything up and shipped it out on Thursday. Friday, uh, they cut it into the TV show in New York. And then Saturday, we watched it on TV. And then Monday, he sent me another tape. And I went, sign me up for this job. I love this job, where you get to write an album's worth of music every week. So that, I got the bug. And it was also because there was nobody. He was, uh, Paul and the director were in um, New York. And I've, I've done over, I don't even know how many TV shows, maybe 70, Five, I've written theme songs for like 50 or 60 theme TV shows. And believe me, I never had this situation come up again where there was nobody from the network that was like keeping an eye on everything. And so he'd send me these tapes and, and I could write whatever music I wanted. It was like this incredible, it was this incredible situation. And um, the show was successful. And uh, so... I, I, I had kind of accomplished what, I, what Devo was trying to do, which was we thought if we want to be subversive, we have to get into the belly of the beast. I thought I was in there now, you know, and I felt like I could be this agent affecting the DNA of, of America, you know, because everybody's watching TV and they're like, their brains are like, bubblegum just sucking everything up and, you know, and you could go like this to, to brain. So, so I started writing things that, that were based on music that influenced me and that, and that I really liked. And then I, right away, I got offered commercials. And the first one was a Hawaiian Punch. I'm picking Hawaiian Punch because that's the one it was. And uh, I remember I wrote the music, and, and it was kind of loosely based on a, something Devo had done <clears throat> at a live show with a, a video of robots dancing in sync, and one of them was out of sync, and, I, and we'd time things so I wouldn't have to look. I could point a gun and shoot it, and it would explode uh, while we were playing. But they had these dancing robots in this Hawaiian Punch commercial, and I... And there was a drum solo like about five or ten seconds before the big ending hits in, and, and it went do doom boo doom boo doom. And I, I over that I went, sugar is bad for you. I just I just said it just like that. And Bob Casale goes, Are you crazy? What are you doing? And I said, and and it was also because of this film we, we put in the Ann Arbor Film Festival, because the other place we'd played it was at the Akron Art Museum. And I remember after we showed it, this woman came up and she was really angry and she went, I know what you're doing. I see what you guys are up to. And we're like, what? What was she talking? And she goes, I saw the word obey and the word submit flash subliminally in there. And Jerry and I looked at each other and went, that's such a great idea. <laughs> and uh, so, so I did this music for this commercial and put sugar is bad for you. And we had to take it 
over to Daily and Associates, the ad agency that was putting out, that had the, the campaign for Hawaiian Punch. And so Bob and I are sitting there in this, you know, this room with a, like six or eight, uh, you know, executives or, or, or the creatives, I guess is who, who mostly is. And maybe somebody from Hawaiian Punch was there. I can't remember. But, you know, you pl the music's playing and everybody's watching the, the film and they're watching the robots dance. And then it cuts to humans dancing along with the robots, just like in the Devo concert. And, uh, and it gets near the end and I just started turning bright red because I was already embarrassed that of what was going to happen, and Bob Casale's looking at me like, you're such an idiot. And, <laughs> and it gets to the, to the end of the commercial, and it goes, sugar is bad for you. Dun, dun, and the commercial ends, and I look at these guys, and they're tapping their pens on the table like this. You know, they're like, they're like executives at a, at, a, at a commercial agency. And as soon as it's done, the one guy goes, yeah, Hawaiian Punch hits you in all the right places. You know, and, and Bob and I just looked at each other. Bob goes like, you're so lucky. You got away. <laughs> and so we got all these commercials. And of course, you know, because I was doing Pee Wee's Playhouse and I did Hawaiian Punch, then you get people, they try to pigeonhole you the minute you do something. So in, in Hollywood, oh, I know what they do. They, they do kid stuff. So I got kids commercials and Mountain Dew, like really some of them were just things you really couldn't like. So I, so it was, I, I just started, you know, we just started putting something in like, like uh, question authority or, um, <laughs> or your parents aren't always right. <laughs> that was a good one. And, and it just, we just got away with it. We just kept doing it for a long time. And it just made me really get kind of excited about this job I was doing. Because, um, you know, it's like I'm talking to people. And then, and then with TV shows and films, it, was, it, was all, it would just turned into be this great gig. Because I could just look at a picture. And whatever music I felt like writing... I just wrote it, and you know, the, the, the people would come in, and the directors, and they go, you know, oh, you know, I just really want this movie to just, I want this, this is a romance, you know, I really want the romantic elements in this film to come through, and you know, and they tell you all this stuff, and you're looking at him going, he's wrong, and then as soon as he, he leaves, I just write whatever I wanted, and then the next day when I played it for him, I go, this is what you asked for, and they went, and it's so abstract to talk about music. I mean, if you ever try to talk about music with a director or producer, you know what I'm talking about. They, they, they don't know how to talk about it, so they go, yeah, that's what I asked for. And you can, just, you can convince them, you know, and, and they, they're just happy that they have something on their, their film so they can, you know, turn it in on time. So, so you scored. <laughs> that was great. I drank coffee uh, right before I came out here, just so you know. So you scored over 150 films and TV shows and video games and cell phone rings. Um, and so over the last four years, three or four years, visual art has been a bigger part of your life. How has that changed um, your, the sort of, your, 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 the creative landscape in your mind? Uh, Okay, I, I know you're saying it's a bigger part, and, and you're absolutely correct. But, but I scored four movies last year, but still did museum shows. How many museum shows did we do? We did at least a couple. Uh, we did five. Yeah, or we did six, a bunch of museum six, shows, six, and we, you, know, you have to go there and get everything set up and then uh, do performances, because... Um, we have a six-sided keyboard I, I wrote music for that I, I took to the, to the museums, and it's just this stupid, awesome instrument that sounds really, it looks really good on a screen, too. But um, why am I telling you that? Oh, anyhow, so I'd always done, okay, so working with Hollywood, what happened was, I was an artist from a kid, but I was like, because of the um, stream of consciousness attraction and loving people that spoke in tongues and that and loving people that kind of acted crazy and that looked like and that people that could have been clues onto what's going on in the other 90% of the brain uh, you know it's like um, that 
Uh-oh. What was I thinking? Oh, you're, talking about, you're talking about visual art and the place of visual art in your Oh, life. yeah. So, so with visual art, it's a good thing I was paying attention. It became something that was private and that I protected in some ways. I mean, I did, Jerry and I collaborated on, I, I think most all of the graphics and all of the films, they were in all of the costume and, and things. We did them our, ourselves. We were like the little rascals of rock, of, of pop music at the time, or not so pop music, or art music, or whatever we were. Uh, we were, because we, we did everything ourselves. We didn't hire directors from fancy production companies to um, come up with a, the idea of like, I don't know, I'm imagining this stuff like there's a band sitting at a table at a record company and they're kind of acting kind of bored and, and this guy comes in that's a dir big time director of commercials and goes, okay, here's, the, here's the, a red rubber ball. Somebody drops it and it bounces and then that cuts to another scene, and the ball bounces in, and it goes by somebody with a lawnmower, and then it goes by a girl on the back of a horse, and then it goes, and then one of the guys in the band goes, uh, that girl, can, that's got to be my girlfriend. And the guy, oh, yeah, of course it's your girlfriend. He goes, okay. And so they agree on a, on a stupid rock video, and one more baby, mindless baby picture for a record company gets made. But so I didn't want... I wanted something that I felt like hadn't been, you know, like invaded. And so I had started, I was, I was into mail art when I was in the late 60s. I found in the late 60s that there were people like Robert Indiana and Jasper Johns and Irene Dogmatic and uh, Image Bank and Ant Farm and all these people that if you sent them a postcard, and you did art on ones on it. There was a chance they were going to send something back to you. And if you're like just this, you know, 18 or 19 year old nobody in Akron, Ohio, you know, who paints apartments to pay his way to school, and you're like, nobody knows who I am or what I am. I'm nothing. And Robert Indiana sends you a postcard that he drew on. It's like you feel like you've been recognized. And so I. I started making these, and for, with my vision, it was much easier to work on things that I could get close to, because right now, when I go like this, there's, you guys can't see me in, in, here unless you're in the upper balcony. There's two exit lights up there, and my prescription is radical enough. It makes them bounce like six or eight feet up and down, because I'm looking at everything 100% of the time that my eyes are open, with glasses on, I'm looking at it through like a fisheye lens. It's like looking in a doorknob. That's part of the uh, of of correcting extreme myopia, and uh, it's a trade-off. So never climb on the back of a motorcycle if I'm driving. Uh, <laughs> but you know, um, so postcards became this great thing because then when Devo started happening, if we were driving places, you know, I could still be doing that while I'm sitting in a, in a taxi or I'm on an airplane or I'm waiting at an airport or I'm backstage somewhere. I could still do these drawings and, and I was like recording things that were going on. And I, at some point I realized it was a diary and um, that I was writing lyrics and coming up with ideas for album covers and things that maybe I should hang on to them instead of mailing them away. So I was also this geek stamp collector when I was in uh, high school. So I knew that you could go to a stamp shop and they had these archival red albums that would hold 100 cards. And so I started buying those books and every time I'd finished the 100 card, I could then put it on a shelf. And I started that in the early 70s. And um, I still do it to this day. I just showed you some cards that I was drawing backstage while we were sitting there waiting. Um, did I accomplish what we were? It's fine, it's great. I mean, you were talking about the role of visual art recently. Though. Oh, okay, so. <laughs> so I still, it's like after, you know, and after we did those six albums where, it, I mean, it was so frustrating to work with record companies because we'd say, hey, we want to we um, 
we want to have a pop-out postcard on the front of our second album, Duty Now for the Future. And the record company said, well, we're not going to pay for that. That'll cost you 10 cents. And we're like, but you only pay us 48 cents for each album we sell. And they go, now it'll be 38 if you want that. And we said, do it. And so we, so we put a punch, punch out postcard and almost nobody ever punched them out. It's like when, when kids, like when Devo fans, like over the last 30 some years come to me and want me to sign that record, I almost always punch it halfway out and sign the back of it. So that, just so they even know there's a, there's a you know, that it, there was a punch out thing. And so, so when I started printing again, because printing was what I loved in, in college, that it became my, my love, because it, it, was, was, it was before computers, and it felt like it was instant grat, because I could, when all the kids left school at 3.30, I could start printing, and I didn't have to queue up with other kids to burn a screen and then print a color, and then when it dried, I'd start another one. Uh, I could print a whole print in one night, and it was like, that was pretty instantaneous in those days. So um, I started printing again in the late 80s. And the first thing I did is I printed with all fluorescent colors and phosphorescent ink on top of that. All things that the record company would have said, each one costs you 10 cents. And I just, I said, I'm printing everything in fluorescent and phosphorescent. And uh, so I, I got that out of my system and after about 30-some prints. But, but I always protected that side of me, and I didn't, I didn't want to get involved with museums or galleries because I thought, that's going to be like being with a record company. I know it will be. I know. And uh, so I avoided it, and I did gallery shows with, like, pop-up galleries. And I did about 125 uh, like during a 10-year period, starting about 15 years ago, and uh, did some up here in uh, in um, Ann Arbor. Yeah, around in Michigan, definitely a number of places in Michigan, in Detroit, and and Saginaw, and uh, Ypsilanti, and uh, and I rem you know, it was always like this kind of thing where it would be these. These a couple of kids that were getting out of college that that year, and they were going to get a job. They were going to be doing graphics for somebody, you know, maybe Kmart or maybe uh, J.C. Penney's or, or or some company would hire them to do the graphics in the newspaper every week, or they would help them do graphics for a catalog. But before they did that job, they still had some time, and they were going to show people right here in Saginaw that we've got some of the best street artists as there are in the world. We've got people right here in our little city that are just as good as, as Shepherd Ferry or uh, Banksy or, or any of those, those guys. And, and uh, they would find some part of town. They wouldn't be where all the other galleries were. They'd go like out into like a warehouse district where they could get some dump of a room and uh, call it their gallery and they'd put out flyers and 30 of their best friends would show up with skateboards and, and they'd have one keg of beer and nobody from the Saginaw Bugle would show up, you know, and so nobody knew who they were and they would eventually all these galleries, they all eventually die out. Um, except for maybe there might be a few of them that managed to avoid that. But most of them, I think all of them just died out. But for me, it was, I, I had a friend of mine who was out of work and he needed a job. And I said, I got a job for you. Get Juxtapose magazine and look in the back for these little half-inch high ads that cost 20 bucks a piece. And look for galleries, little galleries all over the world. And call them and ask them if they, they want to do a show. And so he started doing that. We'd call these galleries and they go, Mark Mothersbaugh, the guy that writes the music for Rugrats? <laughs> and he'd go, yeah, because they wouldn't even know who Devo was. They were too young to even know what Devo was. And why does he want to show here? And he goes, he likes your gallery. And, and um, these kids were like excited about art the way Diva was when we started, it, you know, because like by the time I got out to Hollywood and was doing films, then it's like you got directors and producers showing up at your studio, and they're all they do is complain about the about the um, contract they have with their whoever the studio is, and 
they just talk about all the things they, they hated about the movie, and it was just kind of, you know, although I could, like, go off and do my own thing with the music, I still had to listen to them. And so it was kind of nice to get to have, have a little time with these kids that were, like, still inspired and still loved art. And um, it was good for them because they could call the Saginaw Bugle, who had refused to do an article about them, and they could go, we're doing a show with Mark Mothersby, and they go, you mean the guy that wrote, if they're young, the guy that works at the Saginaw paper, he might go, you mean the guy who does music for rug, for um, uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse? And then if they were a little older, they go, oh, you mean the guy from Devo? And uh, anyhow, so they'd say, that's so weird. Why would he show at this dump? And, you know, because, you know, he, they, it was in a, some part of town where, you, where, like, the art buyers were not going to go, you know, like dentists. We're not going to take their wives to this weird warehouse district to, to go look at art. But, you know, they could get people, you know, we could get people to, some people to show up at their gallery, and, they, and it would get them an article in the Saginaw Bugle for the first time. And, and so it was a, this thing where it was symbiotic. And, and I was really happy with that. I was really totally fine with that existence. And then some big gallery guy from New York showed up at my, called me up and said, hey, are you represented? I hear you're doing shows. And I said, yeah. And um, I don't have any representation. No, I just do it myself. And he said, well, I want to look at your art. And he came over and he looked at it and he goes, I can't sell art for these prices. You have to, my clients need things that cost $50,000 or more. I can't sell artwork for $300? That's what you sell that for? And so I said, well, yeah, but I show at these small galleries right now, and I get emails all the time where kids will send me a photo, and they'll say, I just bought my first piece of art this weekend. And uh, they'll send me a picture of their, their living room or their bedroom or whatever room they stuck the art up in. And he's like, wow, you've got a lot to learn, or you're just... <laughs> You're, there's something wrong with you. And it screwed me up a little bit because then I was like, uh-oh, did I really mess up? And so I was kind of like in this place where I felt really like I'd really made a big mistake maybe. And I thought I was doing the right thing. And it made me question myself anyhow. And so, and at the same time, I'm doing Wes Anderson movies and uh, doing things like the movie, 21 Jump Street, or, or whatever movie I've done uh, at the same time that I can, because I figured out this way to like write a piece of music, tell my engineer, okay, put that into the film where it's supposed to be. And so while he was mixing it, I could go and I have this other room at my studio, I could go over there and I could take like these cards that I work on. And if I found one that I really liked, like if I really liked this beetle be, being held in a, it looks like a diaper or something, a giant beetle in a diaper. I, I could, um, I could put scan it and then put it in my computer and, and work on it a little more. Maybe add color, and I had a pr I have a printer there, so I could then print out prints. And I just do like limited numbers, like a couple, two or three, so that this kid that was buying one inexpensively, he was getting almost uh, an original, but it wasn't quite. You know, it'd be like one of three pieces or something, you know, but, but it was, like, still pretty limited, and uh, it was a nice life, but then uh, this museum, then what happened is I was on tour with Devo about five years ago, and I was playing, like, a, I don't know what this place was, if it was, like, the convention center or the 4-H club <laughs> arena or something like that, I don't know. Denver County Fair. Yeah, okay, there it is, and, uh, this guy called me up, and he said, come over and check out my museum. I have the Museum of Creative Arts in Denver. And uh, I had finished sound check, and I thought, oh, I got like four hours before we go on, so why not? So I walked down this long street, and I was looking at Denver and thought, wow, what an interesting city. And uh, uh, I got to his museum, and his, the museum was great. It was beautiful, and it was like all museums. I, I had already got to this point where I wrote off museums as these places where, oh, it's for rich people. You know, museums are like, they're multi-million dollar buildings with multi-multi-million dollar art collections, and they're not about the real world. And uh, um, 
I met this guy, and he was like, he wanted to talk about Bruce Conner. And Bruce Conner was an artist in the 60s, 70s, and 80s who um, I'd crossed paths with. He, was a, he became a fan of Devo when we were playing at this punk club called Mabuhay Gardens in San Francisco. And I knew of him because I'd seen some of his films, like his A-bomb blast films, where he made, uh, he, ma he made this film that this hypnotize, is mesmerizing the way you see these A-bomb blasts over and over again in it. And uh, I'd seen a couple other short films he'd done that were, and he, you know, so we hung out a little bit in San Francisco and, and um, he asked if he could make a film. He asked if, I, if he could have a copy, uh, an analog tape copy of the song Mongoloid. He wanted to make a, a movie to it. And we're like, yeah, that's a great idea. So. We gave him this tape, and he made this film, Mongoloid, and he used it, found footage, this awesome found footage. That he, uh, some of it's, uh, I've only recently found out where the source material was, but one of them was great, where there's this like housewife, and she's lifting up her hands with like strings of goo, and she's on a ball, a giant gooey ball, and it's part of a, a roll-on deodorant and it's like she's on this giant run. She's like going, yeah. And then there was like a guy that's at work, and he's like, he sits back and starts to daydream. And a suitcase closes up over him, and then whisks him away. And it, and a split second later, it opens up, and it's in Arizona. And he's like, he's like got sunglasses and a and a, and a drink, and he's like in now he's in Bermuda shorts, and he's relaxing, and uh, just all these amazing pieces of footage, and. Um, so you were talking about how we met. Am I way off? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, so I, I knew. That, so this guy, you know, he like um. So this guy, handsome, rugged, <laughs> good looking, Go on. Um, much more articulate than I'll ever be ever in my life. And you know, he we started talking, and I I told him I said, well. I, you know, Bruce made that film. He, you know, he was independent of us. You know, and and but we started talking. I told him that I was doing art shows, and he got interested enough to come to L.A. and started going through these warehouses. I have multiple warehouses filled with with art. I would just I just make stuff, and sometimes it got shown, but almost never, because I just was happy to do it. And he started looking at it and be became interested in enough that he suggested, what about doing a museum show? And my initial reaction was like, well, that, that, that can't be, what, why would I do that? And, and he talked me into it. He put this show together and uh, put this catalog together. And one of the things that really, uh, really uh, was so strong to me is, I found out that other than MoMA in New York, there's probably no other museums in the U.S. that, that are these bastions of, you know, like multi-million dollar buildings, multi-million dollars collection. It's just, you know, for the elite. What they are is they're like NPR radio stations, most of them. In, are you in, just telling people that I have to raise a lot of money in my job? Yeah, and I found out what his job is, and being a director isn't just like hanging out with beautiful people and, and you know, that? drinking champagne with Sylvester Stallone or something like that, you know. It's like he's got this really important job. He's got to go into his community and ignite the imagination of people that can help support the... Uh, they don't want to hear about me, Mark. They want to hear about you. But not just you. There's a, there's a whole bunch. <laughs> okay. And every museum's different. That's what's amazing. Uh, I've been to eight museums, and I've seen places where they have a younger community, an older community, a mixed community, and each director has to be able to inspire the people in that community. And it gave me a whole other appreciation for museums. And a big part of that was the staff. At, at every museum I've been to, they all require these, usually young, but they're of all ages, people that still believe in and love art and find it important 
to them, and they think it's important for the community, and they work really hard, just as hard as these, like, these young guys that had these little, that harder in some ways, you know. And uh, I, I just found to every single museum, it's, they, they attract people that love art and that are willing to roll up their sleeves and help a show get, get completed and, and mounted properly. And um, I have this appreciation for museums that I'm embarrassed came very late in my life, and, uh, but I'm glad it did because it changed my life. It changed the way I think about even my own art uh, uh, so much more now. It's, and the way I think about other people's art, it, it changed it. And I have to tell you that I, in the last few years, I've been on one of the more uh, gratifying, amazing, uh, you know, Act 17 or whatever this is now, Act 37 in, in my life, has kind of been like one of the most amazing places, and I'm so lucky I got to do it. Um, so thank you, Adam. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hey, that's Mark sound. and Adam. That's we Mark and Adam. Up. Yes. You guys are uh, so we, fascinating actually, we, and entertaining. Can we? Um, that we've like, eaten our we've eaten our Q and A time. Oh, uh, we have. <gasps> what? Okay, then if you guys if you guys are up for it, the only thing is I have to pay the bills and and um, I only get this theater for 15 more minutes. So do it. Line up now if you want to. Do we, can do, we can have 15 minutes for Q&A. Yeah, okay. We're doing Q&A. Okay. All right. We, we can just all go out and hang out in the parking lot or something. It is Hi. raining still, I hope. Here I am. Um, okay. What? Hey, Mark Mother's Pots, Amy Yoke. Oh, Hello. And I have a Lady with for you. white sunglasses <laughs> and a cartoon on your chest. I have oh. a wh it's a whistle for you. Um, I'm sorry about your dad that he went away this year. Wanted to let you know. Um, Thank you. Where else is your exhibit playing? Because that's what everybody here wants to know. Uh, New York City. Yeah, it's at the Gray Art Gallery at NYU, and it will open in the spring. So check the website for the Gray Art Gallery at NYU. Are yeah, these underpants? No. Are these bloomers? You, you get, thank you. Um, Mark, Mark, you have another question over here. I, this is so weird. Um, my mom was in a rock band in the 80s, and I have a picture of you two together. And um, Who's your mom? <laughs> my mom was Karen Meso of The Little Girls. This is, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about? What does that mean? Oh, God. <laughs> um, but we talk about this picture all the time. I just wanted to show it to you. Oh, that's nice. oh and that was around. her boyfriend, Rodney Bingenheimer, the not her DJ. Boyfriend. Oh, it wasn't. Oh, maybe it was. He thought it was her boyfriend. Oh, <laughs> I'll have to ask her about that. Oh, well, yeah. what are you doing here? Because that's Mark, I know where Mark, this was. This was, in, um, this was in Santa Monica Civic. Yep, my, I grew up in Santa Monica. Oh, um, okay. I my family moved to Portland, Maine, a couple years ago. I go to school here. I'm on my way to an audition for a thing. And I just had to run in and, uh, I don't know, I give it to you? I don't know. I just, I printed it. You I should, don't know what I'm you should. Doing. I'll keep it, but I'll, I'll, I'll I don't. Okay. It's, I yeah, don't, uh, don't show it to anybody. I, it looks like I have an adult diaper underneath my black shorts, but, you know, who knows? So, Maybe. Cool. This has been weird. Thanks. And your mom was cute. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> That's I remember awesome. We thought, That's we thought, awesome. Rodney, he gets, he's a DJ. He's a famous DJ. He gets all the... Wait, we go, now we go to the left side here. Say hi. Is she, Mark. Is she okay? I, I will. Okay. <laughs> yes. No. I, I, no. Bye. It's you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. I should put these panties on while we're Should I here. talk? Okay. Yes. Well, Mark, um, I don't really have a question for you. I just wanted to tell you. Um, Put the mic close to your mouth. I've been okay. in a rock band for a while. Okay. You, you, you didn't you've hear just me been that. there for some really pivotal moments in my life. Um, I was in art school in New York in like 79, and I went to a Devo concert, many Devo concerts. I think I probably even 
waited outside to like assault you and the rest of the Devo guys. But um, <laughs> then many years later, in like 86, I went into an art gallery in New York and I bumped into you. And it was another pivotal moment of my life because I actually said to you, um, Martin Mothersbaugh, you used to be my biggest fan. No, I used to be your biggest fan. So I got like so flustered seeing you. And I remember, no, I, yeah, yeah, but yeah, you were really, really nice. And so I just wanted to thank you for being there and helping me in my life in various times. Oh. And I'm so happy to see you now that you're, you're doing wonderful and I love your art. Oh. And, and I might want to mention you pivoted very well coming down here. So <laughs> your pivotal <laughs> momentum is working. Thank you. Finally. Thank you, thank you for saying that. Okay, there's yeah. somebody with a super high-tech chair, and I'm jealous. <laughs> that looks super great. Do you believe in synchronicity? Um, what? Do you believe in synchronicity? The, the question was, do you believe in synchronicity? Um, sure. Yeah, she, yeah. He says sure. Who doesn't? <laughs> Hi. I have this postcard I made. Can I trade you for one of yours? Um, does it have to have something on it? Because I avoid doing that. To, I, I go to great pains to avoid this. Yeah, let me see what I got. Let me see what I got. No, don't do it, because then now, if I do it, it'll mm -hmm. set a precedent, and then every single person in the room, I'll have to draw them a picture. I'll never get to bed tonight. <laughs> you, I can't do it. I don't have the... That's fine. Keep that. Oh, thank you oh, very much one. for that. Okay. Don't show anyone. <laughs> okay, over here. Hi. That's a good drawing, though. Now I feel, feel guilty. <laughs> Oh, well. Send it to the curator. Nice drawing. It's good. I saw the uh, Raymond Scott documentary a few years ago. and Which you one? And, uh, Raymond Scott. Oh, yeah. And you ended up with his keyboard, and I forgot the name of it. Motown the Electronium. Hand. Yeah, did you ever get it up and running? Because it was kind of sad. Uh, I'll tell you where, what's happening now. Either my brother Jim has this genius electronics guy that works with him, to, and they're going to take it, or it's going to go to Brian Cahew from a Moog Cookbook. I don't know if you know that band, because uh, he's very knowledgeable about this stuff, because it's, it's been to a couple different people. And, and when I first saw the keyboard, does anybody know who Raymond Scott is? Okay, yeah, he's like, for those who don't, he was like the Frank Zappa of Hollywood during the 30s, or the Spike Jones before there was a Spike Jones, and he was in like uh, Bob Hope Road movies, Road to Morocco. His band would be sitting there with turbans, and they were, and and they wrote all this. He wrote all this music in the 30s and 40s, back before you, before cartoon music was considered um, copyrightable. They didn't even let you copyright your music if, in those days if it was for a cartoon. But but his music got re-recorded. Uh, it, by Carl Stalling in all sorts of Looney Tune movies. And then his current wife, well, his, when, when, oh no, I, what am I saying current? Because he's been dead for quite a while. But his wife, who I think is still alive, uh, was a second marriage who married him in the late 70s. And I went over to, a friend of mine uh, was doing an article on him and said, hey, and I said, he's still alive? And he said, yeah, come on with me. So we went to his house. And uh, he had had about seven strokes and was like, it was over for, for him. It was so sad. He was, but he ran around the house. He looked like Uncle Sam. And he was going, hello, goodbye, hello. And he was just saying stuff like that. And um, she said they she found out that he wrote that music because of Ren and Stimpy. Because they started getting ASCAP royalty statements. And she was going, what's a Ren and Stimpy? What is that? And so then... Uh, when she asked him about it, he just said, oh, that was a long time ago. And I went back into his laboratory, and everything was totally in disarray. It looked like it had been neglected for years, and there were all these acetates from uh, radio shows that he had, his band had played on, and it would say, like, Ella Fitzgerald with the Raymond Scott Band. And it, it's the only recording of it, you know? on this disc, and there were stacks of this stuff, and there was this guy that was like a gardener who now was the caretaker, and he said, hey, you want to hear one of them? And he walked across the room to us, and he went and stepped on and broke one, and we go, oh my God, you just broke one of those 
one-of-a-kind acetates. He goes, there's hundreds of them in here. And so, so when he passed away a few months later, I, I, with a couple other people, I helped get his intellectual archives collected, protected as best as possible, and it went to a university in the Midwest that specializes in that stuff. And um, the only thing they didn't want to take was the electronium because it weighs like a ton, and it was a work in progress. Um, if you ever get really bored, go, go look up um, Soothing Sounds for Babies, and uh, oh my God, it's so awesome, this three-album set that he did where any, any, if you ever read articles about the electronium, he, he says stuff like, it's the first musical instrument that writes music by itself. And, and now that's a big deal, because there's some instrument now that wrote some horrible pop song I heard on, on NPR a couple days ago, and it's got lyrics and everything, and it's really, but this, but this stuff that it wrote was kind of like, it went, uh, it was, record one was for babies zero to six months old, and it went boop, beep, beep, boop, 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 beep, boop. and then record two, six months to 12 months, went boop, boop, beep, 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 boop, boop. And then record three was, you, you know, 12 months to 18 months. And went, anyhow, so, yeah, we're hoping that we're going to get it working. Well, thanks. Right, over here. And, and thank you for saving it. Um, can you do an impression of Chucky Finster? Uh, no. I don't have the right glasses, but... That's what that's that's where it came that's where that came from anyhow. Awesome. Hi. Uh, what's something that you uh, never expected to come out of what you've created? Like something I never that expected? Yeah, like you've had such a decorated life, you've done so many different things. What's something that you never expected? Also, I love Okay, your shoes. I'll tell you one for sure. <laughs> I never expected for all these cards that I draw every day. Um, I always was totally uncensored when I made them uh, for, since, you know, the early 70s. And I was totally uncensored, and um, I would write things that I was really angry or that I was really paranoid or I was really sad or I was really happy or that I was being cynical or I, totally not PC or... or mimicking horrible things in the culture. Uh, and because I'd show them to the, the only people that ever saw them, if anybody did, would be the other Devo guys. Because we'd be on tour, bored to death, you know, just like sitting in a plane for 12 hours going somewhere. And uh, he got me to put them in, he, to put all the books out on, on these, uh, we put them on these low tables. It looked, we wanted it to look like, you know, like, a plane crash, and then all the, all the things that were part of the plane crash are all laid out so that, you know, the, so the FAA could go through and, like, try and figure out what happened. And so this one room uh, had all these low, he put these low-hanging lights over it that were great. And um, I thought he was going to use marijuana grow lights because it was the year that um, marijuana became legalized in Colorado, but he found these other ones that were really good, and we put them over top of these tables, and... Is it the, expens the expansive photo of all of... The yeah, there's photos you, somewhere. The did you yeah. say 30,000? Yeah, 30, yeah, I showed it to them, the last, yeah. the last photo of this. Uh, oh, okay. I love the symmetry top. in that as well. Like in, yeah, in I remember being like, the first time I saw it, I got sick in the stomach, that I felt like I was the most naked I'd ever been in my whole life. And then I, I came around to loving that room the best, and that's the room I wanted to sleep in in every museum before oh, they closed. That's so nice. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Hey. Uh, what'd you have for lunch today? Oh. He knows. A veal parmesan. Yeah, I went to that place that, um, what's the name of the place? Dominic's. Yeah, Dominic's, because it was connected, because there's all those amazing images from the Ann Arbor Film Festival up on the wall, the old graphics, yeah. and it just kind of, was, that's, that was my time, so I really loved seeing all that stuff again. Cool. So, Hi. So, um, I'm a 
local film photographer and I've been working on a community darkroom project for the last year and I'm like sort of in this like tunnel of darkness just like fighting through to the light at the end of it and I just sort of um, like see that you're like further along in your artistic journey so I'm sort of looking to like wiser artists right now at this point to like journey through and so um, I guess the question I have for you is um, like with your vision and your family, like you said it like with such humor and I'm like one of seven and I have the same vision problem as second grade too. And so it was really freaky and I sort of am not like, I'm not like settled with it. You seem yeah. so settled with it. And I just sort of know, like, want to know like when you found that peace within yourself, like, like, how, like well, that's sort of, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I just, it's sort of like the tortured artist thing, isn't it? What drives most of us like to make our, Work, you know. I, I, know. I, I guess we all have things, if you can find some way to use that energy, that's the yeah, important yeah. thing. That's what I think. And yeah, yeah. Whether it's like you never talk to your mom and dad again and never go to Thanksgiving dinner, yeah. that's, that's just as valid as anything else. And yeah, see, it seems like you use your cards though as an outlet, because I, I do a lot of self-portraits and I use that as my outlet. So. Is, is that what, I mean, I guess that's my question, is like, how have you channeled your... How are we ever going to see all your self-portraits? Are you on the internet or something? Yeah, I'm on the internet. What is it? Um, well, I was going to give you this book, and my email address is Play there, bigger? So. How pirates, dreamers, and innovators create and dominate markets. <laughs> how you win. Okay. Category king. You're a category king. I'll be, I'll be doing readings out of this book tonight. At bedtime. At Dominic's. Check it out. Hi. You want me to use that one? <laughs> this one's too short for me. I'll try and keep this succinct. Um, so I'm a musician and a multimedia performer that's just starting out with a career in composing and scoring things. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your methodology and your train of thought in terms of like when you're scoring for television and movies, because there's an element of synesthesia, for me at least, in terms of like using visual stimuli. So like, what do you turn to? Is it more like in response to the tape or the treatment directly, or are there other mediums that you use to sort of get the ball rolling? You know, I just, I look for things in, in a project that I'm doing, I just look for things that I find, whatever I find that's exciting about somebody's movie. Because, you know, the reality is, film and TV, you know, I used to wonder, how come there's so many shitty films and TV shows that come out? How could there be so many? And then once I realized how the process works, there's so many people that can, that can like, screw it up along the way. You know, there's so many ways it can happen, you know. It, writers, actors, producers, people that are all trying, they think they're doing the right thing or they think they're, they, they might even be well-meaning, but they're, they, they screw it up. And then it's like I get a script and, and I sign on for a film and I go, how are they, I go, there's a great script. How are they going to screw it up? And then you see the, the first cut of the film and you go, that's how they're going to do it, you know? And so, so I just try to find something that for me, I think is, is something I can latch on to and inspires me. Uh, do you, have you written for film yet? Not, only my own. TV? No else's. Mostly Well, you're in a good town. You're in a good town for, because there's so many people that have projects that, are, that, are, that right. come here. It's like, you just, I think the thing to do is, is just find some of these people that need some music. And even if it's not a, the best film, Look at it and find something in there that you could, that you go, I could make this film better. And if, even if I can't save the film, I can write some great music anyhow. And just write really great music so that even if people go, did you see that film? It stunk. But the music was pretty good. That's so what you... you yeah. So and you then, find that the things that, you ins that inspire you, that you pick out of whatever it is that you're working on, that then triggers some sort of melodic, like that triggers the ideation. It's, it's all different things, and I don't know what excites you about writing music. Different things do for me. Like, I like playing with eccentric instruments, whether they're electronic or old acoustic instruments. I, like, I bought this one 
dulcitone, which is kind of like a cheap version of a celeste, only because there were two notes stuck at the bottom. There was a D sharp and a and an E natural that were stuck together, and I used that. I never fixed it. I kept it broken because uh, I, I think I used it in some show called um, Last Man on Earth, but I used that when, when I was writing some of the themes for Last Man on Earth, and so you'd hit the one note, and you'd always get two notes, and, and I always loved it about that, that instrument, and so I just look for things that, that are inspiring and try and match them up with something. Thank you. So we just have a few more minutes, Mark. So we'll make your can you make your questions a little answers a little quick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, of all the different things that you've done, do you have a favorite TV movie play postcards? It changes. It changes, it changes all the time. Every day, probably it changes. There's some, you could ask me, and I'd tell you something different. Um, I have an idea for something right now that I've done about, I've done like about 30 or 40 minutes of the music for it, and I've got about five or 10 minutes worth of the graphics for it, and it's, it makes me stay awake at night, and I'm thinking about it, and I might even have an investor, but I don't know, because it's crazy people from China, and, and I can't really tell how real anything they say is. They, you know, and I finally just had to say, just, if you put money in my bank account, then we have a business deal, but not until then. <laughs> and then you know, my so. second question is, uh, of all the places you've been in the world, do you have a favorite place that you've been? Boogie Boys Playpen. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Hey, Mark. We've never met in person, but about 25 years ago, we uh, collaborated on a... I was one of the ad guys that you helped... Uh, subvert Madison Avenue with. We worked on a NTW National Tire Warehouse commercial. But anyway, I don't know if you, you probably don't remember that one. But anyway, uh, we had to... Choose your mutations carefully. Okay. You had to, we had to redo it because some musicologists thought it was too close to uh, REMs, the end of the world as we know it. Anyway, that's not the point. The, what I wanted to ask you is, you're a musician and you've worked in advertising. There's people like Neil Young, who you worked with, you know, will think that's bastardizing his art and he'll never do it in Bruce Springsteen, but you know, like you or Bob Dylan don't have a problem with it. I'm wondering how you look at it and whether you just think that's just another venue to create. Well, you pretty much summed it up right there. <laughs> it's just another venue to create. And the here's one of the things I do like about commercials is it's this area where you're you're almost never, you're always anonymous. So if you've got like some odd instrument or some idea about something you wanna try it out, try it out in a commercial, because if it doesn't work, then they just don't buy Duracell batteries, you know. Or, or tires. Or tires, yes. Thanks. Or they have to rewrite it. Hello, two-part question. Uh, did you direct the video for Whip It? And uh, is Jerry any, did. Jer okay. Any hidden meaning? And what? Any hidden meaning? In Whip It? Yeah. I know. You think it's about dogs, right? It's, yeah. <laughs> well, it's semi true that, it, that, well, here's the two things that kind of how that video came about. We found this, it was kind of, we wrote the song because Jimmy Carter was president, and when we'd travel around the, the, the world, people would say, well, we love America, but your president's foreign policies are driving us crazy. And uh, so, so we, it was a can-do song for, for Jimmy Carter. He unfortunately didn't take it to heart, and, uh, you know, and so he just went back to his peanut factory. And um, what was the other thing? Oh, the other thing was um, we found this film I think Chuck Statler found it. It was this funny film, and it was somebody from Las Vegas who ha wore a magician's outfit, and it was kind of slightly burlesque, but he whipped pieces of clothing off of a woman, and we were like, that's the worst thing we ever saw. We were laughing so hard at it that um, we turned that into like this whole thing where we had a, a Ronald Reagan view of America with cowboys and and uh, a log cabin, and uh, 
uh, Devo were dressed like boat people, if you remember the, the, yeah. the video, and it was, it was what it was. <laughs> All right, so, so, thank so you. this will be the last question. Thank you. Um, um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, folks. This better be a good one, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Little Guy. How did you get involved in Yo Gabba Gabba? And I have a little. Yo Gabba Gabba? Yeah, I have a little stamp for you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Devo. Abe, are you Abe? Yes. Hey, Abe. Okay. Um, Yo Gabba Gabba. Uh, I get asked to 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 do a lot of stuff, and I I don't do them all. But but um, this band called the Aquabats. I'd produced a song for the Aquabats for uh, another TV show called um, Powerpuff Girls, and so we we became friends. And um, they asked me. They they sent me a copy of their film their show, and I thought, oh, this is really fresh. This is a really fresh show. It looks really great, and it was, it was like of all every TV show for kids show that I got for like years after Pee Wee's Playhouse. Like, this is the new Pee Wee's Playhouse, but it never was. And that was the first time I thought this could. This is kind of like a, a new Pee Wee's Playhouse. It was really great and fresh. And uh, but they didn't want me to do the music. Can you believe that? They didn't ask me to do the music. What? They said, they said, would you be the? I know. They said, we want you to be the art teacher. So. <laughs> If you ever watch the, and that's how come I have a mustache, because I, I was painting them on every week uh, to be the artist, and I draw like a, you've seen it, I, I draw an elephant, and then I don't do the trunk, and I go, hmm, what's the one piece that's missing? And then, <laughs> what? So then, and then I draw the trunk, and then it comes to life, and either it gets big and chases me, or I get little and it chases me. <laughs> and um, I draw potatoes on skateboards, and but I just draw them really fast, and we didn't ever plan it out ahead of time. So, so the drawings, like I, the one where I drew a cat doing something, I can't remember what, it was the worst cat ever. And I know that there's two-year-olds that like are sitting in front of a TV with a binky in their mouth going, I could draw a better cat than that. <laughs> but I love the show, yeah, I love the show. And it got me a whole nother audience. I, I, I could go to the grocery store, and there'd be a little kid going, in a stroller going, in the aisle next to me going, yo, Gabba Gabba, yo, Gabba Gabba. And the mother would be like looking at all the magazines on the stand, and I'd look over and go, you're right, kid. We got a secret from mom. <laughs> and uh, so that was, yeah, fun show. We're not making any more, but it was fun. So, and, do you, and do you think? Thank you. Hey, do you think, did you see the Lego movie or not yet? Yeah, I've seen the Lego movie. Okay, do you think that the Lego movie stole Awesome, from a, from a Yo Gabba Gabba. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I don't know. There was other people saying awesome too, so it wasn't just. All right, thank you guys. Is awesome. Yes, that's great. That's great. And hopefully it stopped raining. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. The theater wants the theater back. <laughs> <laughs>